It's time to get the breakdown started. One, two, three, three. First up, 10 observations. It's first and 10. My fancy numbers aren't working, so we're just going to get rolling with number one. Uh, obviously, this is a game with a huge cost. Um, Jaden Daniels not finishing this game, not playing most of this game, is terrifying in the long term because it is a reminder uh, and I guess what I would call the quiet part out loud, right? The quiet part of all oh, this winning streak, the success, the everything is it's fragile. This is the nature of the NFL. This is not something that is specific to Jaden Daniels, even if there's a lot of consternation about Jaden's durability because of his size, you know, not being the, the, the biggest, thickest guy in the world before the draft. The reality is the data doesn't really support the, the concerns about size when it comes to injuries. Have there been some smaller guys that have gotten banged up? For sure. But the concerns about size when it comes to quarterbacks are the ability to be dragged down easily, the inability to see through throwing windows. Like th- there isn't a lot of really like, oh, it's because they get crushed and stuff. And this injury was kind of freakish in that way. He just got bent funny getting tackled. I think that there is a lesson out in the open field like, hey, man, like, Let's keep the, the hits predictable. So if you you have a lane to the outside, like let's stay to the outside and, and see if you can win a foot race. One, you're really fast and you might win a foot race. Two, uh, in this particular case, as Jaden runs out to his right, you know the hit has to come from the left. There's you, there's there's a way you can protect yourself on that. Um, so injuries happen in football, and that's the reality that until they get a better roster with depth, like there are injuries away at multiple spots from things not going as well. And obviously... Things still went really well yesterday uh, for reasons that we will discuss. But the number one thing coming out of this game is is what happens with Jaden. Now, I will say, after hearing Dan Quinn, I have a pretty, like, I've been around football and I've been around this staff enough uh, this year that they're pretty honest on stuff. Uh, and there's a way they word things that I think are, are pretty straightforward. And then I have the medical enough background with my training, whatever, to kind of understand some of the things that are in play here um, and some of the things you can rule out. Like, he doesn't have a broken rib. Uh, you know how I know that? Because Dan Quinn said that it wasn't a contact situation. Like, they're not worried about him getting hit again. They're worried about whether he can throw and run and be an athlete. So if that's the case, that tells you it's something muscular. It's something where there, there's a strain or a pull and whether it's a cartilage or uh, one of the little muscles in there because you got a whole bunch of stuff that, that's holding your core in place, like oblique, whatever it is, um, they're calling it ribs. So I'm guessing, the, the, you know, it's, it's the cartilage situation like that stuff hurts. It's really uncomfortable and it does impact your ability to create torque, which is kind of important to throw a football or if you need to, to be slithery and slide and move like that, those sudden little twitchy movements can anger that thing. So we'll see. Like, it, it, I think that the other hint here is Dan Quinn said it's going to come down to my eyes in practice. It's not him getting clearance from a medical team. It's Dan watching Jaden play and going, this looks like Jaden. We can play him. Or this doesn't look like Jaden. Um, he's going to not be able to, to help us as much as we want. And thus, it's not worth the risk of putting him back out there where he makes it worse. So, of course, there'll be medical people involved. I would guess a guy like Adam Peters is involved, too. He's got to have the long-term vision, uh, and that, that's kind of his job, where Dan's is more day-to-day, even though I think they both look at, at the others uh, and try to weigh the factors the best they can. But ultimately, like that's what we're talking about here, is some kind of rib injury, muscle, cartilage, et cetera, that one Jaden can perform and the risk of re-injury is low. He'll play. Until then... You know, we're obviously in doubt of the Jaden Daniels, Caleb Williams showdown that we were hoping for on Sunday. Um, Number two, I I just want to talk about real quick in terms of his management moving forward, which is it shouldn't change one bit. Um, I understand the freak out of he can't run. He's going to get hurt. Oh, my God. No way. It's the design runs aren't what's going to get him hurt. Um, and certainly something that's freakish like this. Yes, inherently you're going to then take probably more hits than if you stood in the pocket. The biggest hits quarterbacks take are in the pocket. He has been tremendous at avoiding hits. He got hit in a funny way and got bent. This could have happened to a wide receiver. It could have happened to uh, any ball carrier. It could have happened to a defensive back on a pick. It, it could have happened on a scramble that was not a design run, as Dan Quinn pointed out. This was a kind of a fluky thing. 
It happened to come on a play that was that started a design run. And by the way, that play uh, was 46 yards and, and ultimately was the, the drive starter on a touchdown drive. So if you want to have the maximal offense around Jaden Daniels, he has to run. It helps everybody else, and there's not a way around it. And unless you want to undercut one of the big reasons why he's been great, this is part of the deal. And that is he is exposed to everything else that every ball carrier is, which most ball, most carries, most catches, most everything end up in every all, all 22 guys getting up off the field. And that's just the reality of the situation. So I understand the consternation. I'm not saying that uh, the feelings that you're feeling of concern are not coming from a place where you just want to see your guy healthy. What I'm telling you is the solution isn't to take out the running game. That's not going to help anybody. It hurts the offense, and that's that's kind of the Jaden Daniels piece of it. Uh, number three, last thing on the offense real quick, and then we'll get to a bunch of defense stuff uh, as well as a couple other news and notes in the back half of our first and ten. But number three, the offense deserves a ton of credit because they continue to pour it on and absolutely cook with Marcus Mariota at quarterback. A little bit of a rough start. Uh, he has a keeper, and then uh, Cornelius Lucas loses big time quickly uh, on, a, on a pass play, and they wind up in a third and long after a penalty. And then Cliff calls a perfect play. Diami's wide open, and Marcus just misses him. And then Marcus comes back out and misses a couple other throws. And they got back into the run game. He got a couple carries, and all of a sudden he found a rhythm to an extent, and he absolutely cooked from then on out. He was fantastic from middle of the second quarter all the way through basically when they stopped trying on offense. And a lot of that has to do with this is a very well-designed, very well-called, very well-executed offense, and the O-line deserves credit, and the receivers deserve credit, and Marcus deserves credit, and Cliff, and Anthony Lynn, and Tavita Pritchard, and Bobby Johnson, and I don't want to leave anybody else out, so I'm going to stop. Uh, David Rye, yeah, there you go. Go Rye, uh, the tight ends coach. Give them all credit. Also, the Panthers are terrible, and I cannot stress enough how much of an impact that had in this game, which is not meant to say that the Commanders actually performed secretly terribly they took the tests that they were presented with and they scored maybe not an A-plus because they did have a couple of field goals and there's some red zone stuff that obviously if you get an A-plus, you score all of them touchdowns as opposed to stalling out in the red zone a couple times. But they for sure as you know what got an A. But the Panthers were not very good to begin with and they have a bunch of injuries and of their front seven, they're starting like day one, week one, front seven projected group. One dude played in this game. So you're talking about one of the worst teams in football that is super talent deficient, and you got the backups on that team playing against your offense. Again, commanders did exactly what they were supposed to do. They went up and put up a 40-piece. But all the times that things didn't go perfectly to plan, that Marcus wasn't in a rhythm, he could kind of just stand there or shift around a little bit in the pocket. Oh, we got four seconds to throw. Sweet. Oh, there, now someone's open. Oh, uh, no one's open. Let's run around a little bit. And let's scramble. Pass rush completely non-existent. Again, their front seven super banged up. So you run for 200 yards on them. Like, that is a bad... It, it's it's beyond a bad football team. They are bad and they are banged up. And something weird is happening in the NFL this year where the bad teams are extra bad. The worst... Like, uh, the, the guys who do DVOA, um, Aaron Schatz is the main guy behind it. And according to their metrics, they have never had this many teams that are this bad by their their metric in terms of we're 30% worse than the league average. They've got like five or six teams that are that bad. It is brutal. And I don't know exactly what's causing it. I don't know exactly what it is. It's something that I actually kind of want to explore on the show this week to see if we can figure it out. But teams like Cleveland, teams like Carolina, you know, it, you're they're just horrendously bad football teams and the commanders to their credit have beaten the crap out of them to the point that they have the league's best point differential that is a credit to Washington but it is not like oh this offense is just fine without Jaden Marcus can run it no the Bears defense is good it is a very different challenge and the precision 
and the decision making, the creative ability, and all the stuff that Jaden provides is going to be much, 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 much more needed than it was against a Carolina team that is essentially if you took Marcus Mariota and the the rest of the Commanders ones against most teams threes and fours in the preseason and said go play 60 minutes of NFL football. That's what happened yesterday, and the score line was certainly reflective of that. Number four. The game flow in this game is something that I talked about a lot last week. Logan and I did uh, on Take Command as well. And uh, ta-da, don't we look like a bunch of geniuses? And yeah, the Panthers were really bad, but they also... There's a version of Carolina that's that's can compete, especially offensively. And that version of them runs the football... Dandy Dalton gets some some matchups here and there, and he can deal a little bit. That version never had a shot once the opening drive happened. Because they actually had that version for the first part of the opening drive. And then Andy Dalton threw a pick six, and then things went downhill. Why? Because Carolina abandoned the run. They tried to chase the game, and they had no shot. And I told you that if this thing gets the wrong way for Carolina score-wise, and they have to chase it, it could get really, really ugly. And sure enough, 40-7 to 7 later, sometimes your boys know what they're talking about. And although I feel like sometimes we can talk about that game flow stuff and how it can magnify strengths and weaknesses, um, you know, and it feels like it, it's almost too obvious, this is an example of why it can be so, so important. Number five. Number five. One of the guys that changed the game. Fidarian Mathis is... Really large, really strong, and really hard to move. And that dude came in in the second series of the game after Johnny Newton had gotten moved a little bit. They obviously have the end around play as well. That's the big, you know, mover uh, for the Panthers on the first drive. But on that second drive, Johnny Newton starts next to Deron Payne. And they tried to run the football again, and it was like, nope, nowhere to go. In the first drive, double team, big movement on Newton. And and Johnny's still figuring things out at this level. Like, he's a rookie. That's going to happen. He has some really special moments that you see the flashes, and you're like, man, this guy's going to be really good when he figures out the basic stuff. Big Phil's just like, I am not moving. And so they try to move him on a double team, and Deron Payne has an enormous uh, amount of space to go make a tackle at the line of scrimmage. Linebackers have more room to flow. And so I I did kind of wonder about this last week, sometimes aloud uh, on the show, of while well, Newton is the obvious next man up in the rotation, is it actually smarter to play Big Phil on first and second down, especially against teams that want to run the football because of how hard he is to move in the run game? And I think that theory showed some credence with how well he played. And like Sheldon Day, same thing. He's a big, big dude. And they're not going to give you a ton of the pass rush. You know, if a team's running a bunch to the outside, they might not give you as much mobility to chase plays down. But they're also going to hold up the blockers from getting out there. It makes your your linebackers and safeties getting downhill better. And I think you saw that uh, in this game uh, in the very small amount of time that there was actually a run game to be dealt with for Carolina. Number six. Number six. Obviously, Dante Fowler had an unbelievable day. I think most people probably also realize Deron Payne had a really good day. The thing I want to point out is how well they played together. Those guys have now started to figure out how to hit some of the timing and some of the angles and some of the the, the nuances on these stunts and twists, and that's going to lead to a lot more of, I don't want to say days like yesterday. I mean, Dante Fowler's been playing for like 12 years. That was his first career interception. So I'm not going to say, hey, they're going to figure out how to pick six a whole bunch. But I do think both of them making plays behind the line of scrimmage is going to happen more consistently moving forward. Yeah, I mean, Carolina's O-line is actually not that bad, uh, but they figured out ways to just absolutely destroy it. And the way they played off each other, the tenacity with which both of them them are playing, their speeds are matched up, and, and yes, each of them individually did really good stuff. But often it was the other one on that left side of the defensive line that were you know responsible for the play so if like you know Payne makes a play go watch what Fowler did it was something really good if Fowler makes a play go watch what Payne did it was something really good and it freed that guy up to be the playmaker that both of them are number seven number seven just just a round of applause Emmanuel Forbes good to see you and I think the obvious is hey got a pick love that 
Dalton threw it right freaking to him. I mean, Forbes played that very, very well. The receiver played that horrendously, but he did play it really well. He's playing quarters coverage. You know, he could have got caught way outside, but he realizes there's no one. He's playing on, on, on the defensive left. There's no one to my left. All that's over there is a sideline. So instead of just going and, you know, standing in the middle of my Madden bubble, if you will, um, I'm going to I'm gonna go actually follow this receiver inside, and I'm going to latch on because that's my job. That's how they're, that's what you're coached to do. And he just he gets right inside. You know, Dalton thinks, oh, I got this easy because the safety that's typically in that quarter of the field has played a little bit deeper. He's been pulled back. And instead of a window, there's Emmanuel Forbes. So that good work, Emmanuel, that's how you play zone. Very well done. But I think the other thing that that was interesting and worth following, a note, if you will, for moving forward, is he was also out there on special teams. He was out there, I believe, on punt return, uh, you know, as, as a blocker and as a, as a gunner on the side. Um, and that means he can stay up as opposed to being the inactive guy. So that, you know, as, as the injuries and in different formations and different personnel packages are, are being used moving forward, even if he's not an every down starter, like let's have that guy available because he's big and he's tall and he's rangy and uh, all the things that made him a first round pick. And maybe he can develop some confidence and earn his way back on the field. But um, the fact that he was out there on special teams, I think, is a good sign. Obviously, that means he's he's willing to do it. Uh, he's not, like, obstinate about it. Uh, but in practice, obviously, they saw enough to say, hey, Emmanuel, you're up this week. Let's go get him. Number eight. Speaking of special teams, damn, these dudes hit. Dan Quinn is literally like, if you play safety for, for me on this team, you're going to be on kick coverage, and I want you to just pretend it's a running play. And that's basically how they cover kicks. And it is a race between Derek Forrest, Jeremy Reeves, Jeremy Chin, like Quan. They're all out there. And it is free for all to the ball. And they arrive and they arrive with bad intentions. And Nick Ballore's like, I want to race too. Jeremy McNichols is like, I want to race too. Those dudes hit. And not only is that going well on special teams for Larry Izzo and company, but Austin Eckler's having an unbelievable uh, year as a returner. Like, you know, obviously Carolina doesn't kick off in the first half because they didn't score. Uh, and they come out, kick off the second half. Eckler returns it to like the 40 yard line. What? That's just like how he rolls. I don't know why you kicked him right now. And so from offense, defense, and special teams, A's across the board in this game for sure. And the last piece of special teams, by the way, number nine. How about just another perfect day for Austin Seibert? It wasn't pretty all the time. Couple of couple of extra points that were uh, one in particular that was very squirrely. You're like, I didn't. That ball looked like it hit the ground and then bounced up and through the uprights. Like that was that was a weird, uh, odd duck. So clearly, you know, there's there's some stuff hidden deep in the demons of uh, of Austin Seibert's right foot that still occasionally try to pop out, but he hasn't missed from under forty. He's barely missed at all in his career in Washington. He has the one block kick, and to think about how much consternation there was for good reason in training camp. And we just kind of said, hey, eventually they'll find someone that's going to get cut by another team. They had a guy in mind. They went and got him. It worked out. Bang, bang. And uh, good for Austin Cyber to continue to be perfect. Last but not least, back to the Panthers real Number quick. Number 10. Can they please just free Bryce Young? Um, I don't necessarily disagree with like what Matt Ryan said at halftime where he said, I wouldn't play him in this game talking about Carolina, Washington. I wouldn't put him in even though you're up to or down 27, nothing because I want him to get the week of practice. But Dave Canales said again today, we got a plan. Uh, you know, we're not, not, we're not changing from that plan. I and Eagle was talking about the broadcast. Oh, we, you know, they say they've got a plan. They just don't want to tell anybody what it is. Canales today was asked again about trading Bryce Young, and he's like, well, some things might change because they initially said no. If Bryce Young isn't ready to come in in a game and, and get valuable experience to just play some reps where it's not going to make him worse, when you're down 27 nothing and the game could not have any less pressure on it, then you need to trade him to someone who believes in him. This dude was, I don't want to say the consensus number one pick, but over CJ Stroud, most people liked him. And I'll admit, like, I liked, I like, I didn't study these quarterbacks nearly as, as obviously closely as I did this year's crop because Washington wasn't in the market for one last year based off their draft position. But they, like, 
I, I liked Bryce Young a lot. And what he did at Alabama was pretty big time. He's really smart. And there's just no way that he should be this unplayable. And if he is, it's reflective of the organization as much as it is the player. So trade him to another organization. There is someone out there right now who would give you a decent pick for the guy who was 1-1 overall last year. This wasn't three years ago. It's not like, hey, rookie contract. Ah, we only got him for a couple. You got him for two more years after this before the fifth-year option if you wanted to try him out for size in the offseason. But just bring him in now. And so I, whew, man, I don't know what team, you know, I, if I was Miami, I would have tried a couple weeks ago. Now two is coming back. But if, if Bryce Young can't get in this game, like Carolina, free Bryce Young. Not saying you made a mistake and not putting him in. But if he's not ready to come in in this one, you got to trade him somewhere else so they can get him ready to be in a game eventually. Because this is this is nonsense. This is the Hoffman Show on the Team 980 and the Odyssey app.